thank you. Thank you for doing that. With Thank yeah, you for great. experiencing that pain with us. That's rough. Yeah. No, that yeah. was, yeah. You, that was you, great. You it's, great. It's the, it's the never fight a pig, you know, that <laughs> you, 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 you all get dirty and the pig enjoys it. And the, <laughs> I don't know who the pig or what the pig is. <laughs> ah, well, the pig is our guest in Into the Spider-Verse. There we go. What a smooth oh, segue. Very nice. First credit. Uh, <laughs> the first ever credit. It was that wasn't your first movie credit, was no, it? No, I mean my first credit of the show. Oh, okay. all yes. my work. Yeah, we'll get to a lot of it here. Um, so we'll we'll definitely get to some of it. Uh, our guest today, we're thrilled that he's here. He just did Johnny jokes with Woo-hoo. us. Of course, you, our friends, know who he is. Uh, he's the incredibly successful Emmy-winning Saturday Night Live writer. Has fantastically popular Netflix comedy specials, including one that will be airing April 25th called Baby J. Folks, Woo-hoo! please welcome John Mulaney. Yay, welcome. Hello, <laughs> Hello John. Hello, Alec, JC, Goldie. Oh, <laughs> welcome. We are very excited that you're here today. And let's just get this out of the way first. I'm very, very excited to. Uh, uh-huh. Wow, you had an extra very. So <laughs> that seems like you topped me. Tag. Over the tag. top. <laughs> yeah. um, let's get this out of the way first. Do we have Dan Levy to thank for this love connection? Oh, oh um, ultimately, yes. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Dan was a guest, what, a few months back? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I enjoyed that episode very much. And then he and I would talk. And then I was listening to your podcast a lot on this tour I was on. And then That's I would nice. talk to Dan and I would talk about it a lot. Oh, and awesome. I asked him. Uh, well, I'll just lay my cards on the table. I asked him to tell you I liked the podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's so awesome. Hoping, hoping you would then invite me on the podcast. And then you didn't take the bait at that. So <laughs> then I said, I said, would you ask them? <laughs> Would you ask them to ask me to do that? <laughs> Is that how that works? That's so funny. I had no idea that's how it went down. I, I was like, I was like, if I go, hey, I really like it, maybe they'll just naturally go, oh, if he ever wants to come on. And then I'll go, oh, yeah, actually I have time. But that you did, just you went, oh, that's cool. And so I said, okay, you gotta go tell Alec again. <laughs> it just mirrors my 90s dating experience where, you know, you there was the Antioch code and those sort of things. And you'd get so tied up. I would get so tied up in my own head about like making a move that by the time the woman was like, "Will you just like kiss me already?" They were already mad at me for not doing anything. And then it, it didn't. And then you you already felt like a coward. And I feel like we did that with you, where it was like, "Yeah, we should have asked you," but we were like in our heads, like he'll say no, and yeah, then we'll he won't stupid. want to. And then yep. he'll start oh, hating us. That makes us. me feel better. I'm glad you were in your heads too. Oh yes. My God. Oh no, hundred percent. No we wanted yet. to ask you so bad. <laughs> I know. Yeah. The the thing is, when I first heard it. I almost felt like because, and you know Dan pretty well, better than we do, but I feel like I know him a little and Goldie knows him pretty well. Yeah. I felt like that was Dan making himself bigger than he was. Like, my friend John Mulaney <laughs> likes your podcast too. And I was kind of like, all right, great. And I, like Goldie, had that same fear of like, we would ask and and you would say no. Oh, I thought we, it was we a would joke. Feel bad. Like, you know, the lady <laughs> listens to it. It's like, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tell me another one. Yeah, so so we do have Dan Levy to thank, which distresses yeah, thank me Thank you, greatly. Dan. And I will say that Dan Levy doesn't big time himself. That he, not that I would be able to big time him, but he doesn't big time himself with I was just talking to so-and-so. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I will, to, oh. to his credit. Okay. okay. He's honest about his, fr- Dan Levy is friends with, anyone he meets yes. uh, like yeah. he, he exchanges his number on airplanes <laughs> <laughs> he just strikes me as su- like he i again i'm probably of the of the three of us i know him the least but i do feel like he's a younger cousin like whenever i yeah. i deal with him it's like I think he's funny and I kind of weirdly love him, but I also think that he's like the younger cousin in my family who's also doing well, who does, who looks at me with zero respect. <laughs> you know? And oh, I'm just like, no, no, no. Oh, I don't think that's the case. No, no, no. He greatly respects you and uh, both of you. And uh, a fun thing about Dan is he really inflates, he likes to uh, inflate what money people make. Like he, <laughs> right. like that's everyone. So that's very Jewish. He's by like, the way. they've been, so they've been on like Family Guy. They've been on Family Guy for years. 
So they have like millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> and he's always, he talks in like, he talks in these uh, apocryphal financial windfall stories. <laughs> like, so then, no, but then he wrote the movie Ted. So he had points on it and he made a hundred nope. million dollars. Nope. And now he has a house in Cape Cod. And I'm like, well, I anyone got- who had millions, like look at the, what's in the behind me. <laughs> Would they have a Tupperware on its side and like a garbage bag of, I don't know what, and like a box on a, on a couch that's not a real sized couch. <laughs> it, and, it looks and, like you're wrapping presents, but yeah, that's true. I know, right? <laughs> you got mad at someone before their birthday and said, right. fuck it, I'm not wrapping this present. <laughs> well, and Goldie, but, and in fairness, he did say, you know, writing Ted, so he's clearly talking about me. Well, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, I, no, I, and Dan always goes one to one of that. So and so made X, normally it's $100 million. <laughs> so and so made $100 million. Like, <laughs> You know, this guy, he was just in the room for the pilot of Raymond. But since he was in the room, he got points. And so he made like $100 million. Like his, <laughs> the enthusiasm he has for these tales is insane. Oh, points. Also, it, it's always that someone made lump sum and with that lump sum bought like <laughs> It's Excellent. always like all of the money from one project goes into a purchase. Yes, which is never the way. Then it goes. he bought a house in Cape Cod. Yeah. <laughs> I got a dad's residual check for a dollar forty-seven. <laughs> I was able to buy these stamps. <laughs> yeah, look at that. You had them right on hand. You're a prop comic. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, by the way, and to first of all, I love that Dan does that. It's all completely not true. And the idea of points is another one of those like great, weird kind of Hollywood myths. I'm not saying they don't yeah. exist, but w- first of all, I had zero points on the only Ted that did really well, which was the first one because we're writing our first movie and nobody's going to like give you points for that. And so then after that, we were like, oh, well, we'll get points now. And the second one comes out and lays an egg and they're like, guess what? You owe us money. Like, oh, no. It's just It doesn't work the way you think it's going to. Right. I um, don't know if it works. Like I know. That's it there we, we don't even call them percentages. We call them points. Like it's not it's not even a uh, it's a fake business. Yes. Like, yes. If you own equity in something, you you will make money if it's successful. If you if you have points, it's like having gold coins. It's like exactly. yeah, invisible. Exactly. <laughs> My conspiracy theory is they were invented to keep the talent mad at each other so that we don't attack the studio because all that's ever happened with points in my career is like someone will call me and they say well you know we had to reduce you or do and then i get i get mad even though there's nothing at stake like i'm like why would why would they get points when i'm here every day and it's like well you're arguing it's like why why do they get more air yeah Yeah, right Um, all right, so we could talk about that for an entire episode, I'm sure. But right. let's, John, let's talk about you a little bit here. You grew up Catholic in Chicago, hardly a unique experience. But no. why do you think there are so many comedy people from Chicago? Have you ever sat down and kind of thought about that? I haven't, no. Um, okay, good answer. Good let's talk. move on to the next I, question. I don't know. <laughs> like, I bet there's, mo- I mean, I bet there's more from New York and... Really? No. Like, no, it's I would say it's Boston and Chicago, weirdly. Like I meet so many comedy writers and performers from either Boston or Chicago, and I kind of feel like it's either be cold and miserable or laugh about it. There's that. I mean, look, I don't mean to overlook some real key things about these cities and super repressed upbringings that would yeah. yield comedians. But I also uh, no, I've never given it a lot of thought. Um I haven't. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to that one. Maybe never. Um, I don't know. Why do you think? Well, I, I mean, I Ooh. just... What's that? Go, go ahead. Ooh, I like, I like this. Oh. Yeah. No, well, I mean, I, a little bit I do think it's because there are sort of cold and miserable gray places where you have a choice of either kind of getting sucked into the system of that city or area or laughing at it constantly. Um, yeah. So I feel like that's part of it. And also, you know, your parents, I'm sure in some way kind of well actually now that i now that i think about it like chicago and if you're interested in show business or the arts and you're in chicago yeah there's there's steppenwolf and the goodman and the art there's there's a lot of outlets but but new york has all the theater yes and you get tons of kids growing up and wanting to go to LaGuardia or frank sinatra high and like do theater arts and then 
Chicago and Boston, I think the thing we turned out was a lot of successful comedy venues. Yes. So maybe it's just like you're looking for a spotlight so you would drift towards that. Oh wow. Did your parents enjoy your humor with your cuz I know your dad was serious, like my dad was very serious, but I I'm, I'm kind of wondering like sometimes the reaction to like a quipping kid like you know. Yeah, I could uh they enjoyed it a lot, but to a point. Like and then it would just suddenly get shut down. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> like cut it, it out. was like they really liked it but i i would just get so um sort of frantic and and manic doing so many bits and then my dad would be like this is silly like this is ridiculous <laughs> i remember i went to lunch with them when i was a little kid and he was like so you <laughs> it's funny that we went to lunch uh <laughs> he goes i told him i wanted to be a comedian and he went so i don't understand you want to be like Steve Martin? And he said it, he said it with like mild contempt. Like, you want to be an idiot? Like, like I saw this, like he came, you know, he's in law school and he's starting his career and there's this guy in a white suit on TV who's acting like right. an idiot. And he's right. like, why would you want to act? Why would you want to be a fool? Uh, and he picked like the most successful one most, you could, you could most, ever want to be. The most sophisticated and <laughs> urbane one, like the most, like both, the yes. most both. The most both. <laughs> well, I, I just saw in one of your interviews that you said that you realized at a very young age, you had this need to be cute and or funny in order to feel liked or loved, let's say. Do you no, still, sure. do you still feel that way? Um, no, le much less so. Yeah, and when um, when do you think did that change with success? Did that change with the sun? Like, what? What? When does that? Oh no, change? no, no! Success didn't help that at all. <laughs> uh, I would say, um, uh, th in the past couple of years, I've just i I had to stop caring. Uh, so, and I and you know I dude I'd say that with a pound of salt. I, right. <laughs> <laughs> I want I want people to enjoy what I do a lot. Yeah. But um but they I do. don't it's not I'm not doubled over with anxiety about it. And yeah, I mean I if anyone has imposter syndrome or or worries so much what their peers or an audience thinks of them that it's crippling, I would just recommend being institutionalized twice and <laughs> <laughs> crashing and burning is really good. It's a really good great for your ego. It's really yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, and and I'll say when my son was born, it's not like I have less anxiety. It just all became like I just think if he's okay, then I'm okay. That's like, if, as long as he's yeah. okay, I'm okay. Yeah, that, it's a that, shift. It all is on that. So luckily, when he, when he hits about five, he'll start <laughs> being like, "Well, no, I don't want him now. He's okay, and I'm not okay, and I'm pissed." It's someone with a. <laughs> Two kids. <laughs> no, it's not enough. Yeah. I want to be okay. We're, 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 if you're looking at the canary in this coal mine, we're both flat on the bottom of the cage right now. So <laughs> be very afraid. Um, but I, 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 I would imagine that because you uh, now have had such great success and an outlet in stand up, you know, where thousands come to your shows, millions watch online, that I feel like Goldie and I haven't had that experience. So the way that manifests in my life is like, I have a yes, seven year old. Yes, well, but, but it's different. You played it's, arena. You played <laughs> yeah, all right, don't do that. <laughs> don't throw the A word at me when you know that it has no Arenas. meaning in my life other than seeing Stevie Nicks and Billy Joel last month at uh, SoFi. Right. Um, but the, the way that manifests in my life is whenever I walk into a room where my daughter's there, I'm, I'm Michigan J frog. Like I, you know, I'm, the hat's coming off. Like I, I feel the need <laughs> oh, to sweet. perform for her. Um, yeah. and I wonder if I know you're uh, also you're... a corpse <laughs> what is that? being what is moved that? around by hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tall Thank is you. moving you. Yeah. Thank you for making my embarrassing moment <laughs> humiliating as well. Um, yes, but I'm wondering, like, do you do you feel like you perform for your son or do you feel like that's coming? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's um, it's it's been really interesting over the past 16 months to see jokes that work. And when they stop working, <laughs> yes. it actually 
it hits me a little deep. It's humbling. Yeah. You used to think that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, like he, like there was a point when he was about seven months old where we would turn on um, Hello, It's Me by Todd Rundegren. And yeah. then he and I would do a funny dance and he'd laugh and laugh. <laughs> and then I remember the day that those opening chords kicked in oh. and he just stared at me blankly. He's like, we've done this. We already did. I know. Oh. <laughs> oh God! Could you have a whiter moment with your kid, Todd Rundgren? I mean, I love yes, it. Yes, I, I could. Love. I could, and I have. <laughs> oh. I was playing. Um, I was. Oh my God! I was being such a like beta ass <laughs> white dickhead dad. I was trying to. I was playing music for him. I was like, maybe he'll like. Uh, you know, maybe he'll like. Uh, okay, computer. It was so lame. Oh, I can't even name. I, I can't good. even name the music. I love that record. And then yeah. I, I turned down pavement for him just to be a total <laughs> little bing Lil. bong of a guy. And uh, my favorite. My son Malcolm went. He 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 rotated his arms like this, and he went round 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 round, which meant play wheels on the bus. Uh, <laughs> and he what... hadn't ever like he'd barely spoken at that point <laughs> and he learned to he learned to talk to be like you can turn this shit off like, yeah. I, get, I get that this was cool maybe in 1998 but like round 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 would be fun silver <laughs> jews what yeah yeah, yeah. You know, this guy <laughs> this guy killed himself malcolm oh, you'll <laughs> love it wait now did, did did pavement sing haircut you mean cut your hair? Cut your hair. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Or cut my hair? I've yeah. Heard. That that song that's I like have, Yeah, that's their song. Yeah. Well, you're headed for a, a milestone yet that maybe you haven't anticipated, which is like you'll become the butt of your kid's joke. And then <laughs> yeah. I mean that's like we were we had a my seven year old's in therapy. Let's not go into why, whatever. <laughs> But so you have to play games in therapy like that to elicit information from you. So one of the you play this game and the card is like, say something you like about your family. And she goes, I can say something I don't like. And I'm like, fuck, like she's going <laughs> to like nail me on something real, you know. And so the therapist is like, well, no, but try to say something you like. And she's like, you know, I love that my family's funny. So I'm like, that's nice. And then she's like. And I love that I feel safe about my family, but I want to say something I don't like about my family. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is going to be really bad. Like, I don't know what I did or what I yelled. And the therapist, okay, what do you not, what do you not like about your family? And she goes, they fart a lot, <laughs> especially my dad. In therapy. <laughs> and then so you're just that? like, so you'll, you'll get burned eventually. By... <laughs> it's kind oh, of, I, yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> but both canaries dead. My, um, my my son's really like uh physical like likes likes prat balls a lot and he does them by standing and then bending over and like, <laughs> touching the floor but i pretend to fall which i'm not is not i don't have a great facility for moving around <laughs> to make people laugh but uh <laughs> but if i pretend to fall that's currently working yeah, right. as is whispering in his ear, pee pee. Then he starts <laughs> laughing. So, but I already can tell. Last night I was putting him to bed, and I did it, and he was like, huh. like <laughs> <laughs> nose breath <laughs> <He's> trailing <laughs> off. So are, I, it seems like you're not mimicking it all the way you were raised, though. Like, are you aggressively doing like what wasn't done for you, or are you? Oh, somewhat, yeah. Um, but that's also the nature of not working most of the day uh <laughs> yeah. you know, i'm not a power lawyer in the 80s so right. I, I, right. I, I'm, I'm 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 a little more free but at the same time i um i can tell like i try to like get whenever i can i try to be dressed up around him so he knows i'm a person of importance <laughs> <laughs> he knows <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Like I, I do, and I and I I very quickly was like, this boy can't be in pajamas all day. Like I I some of the formal aspects of my upbringing I've already started with him. That's, that's good. That's great. Yeah, I, it, <laughs> baby it's should, a baby shouldn't be in pajamas all day. A baby right. should be in little corduroys and suspenders <laughs> and ready to work. <laughs> See, that is that is the way you were brought up. It's funny because I uh, Goldie, that's a great question. I feel like sometimes we consciously say like, oh, I don't want to do what my parents did. But then when you're in action, 
you find that your you it. and your partner kind of naturally gravitate towards the way that you were raised, and it's like a battling of agendas. And so then, weirdly, you find yourself defending this thing that you're trying to get away from, and it creates oh, this whole kind of like end of Reservoir Dogs kind of parent. I can't execute the gravitas my dad had, so it's it's like not on the table. Right. Right. Yeah, what was I, your dad? What was your dad like? My dad was born in 1920 and fought in World War II and was awarded a Silver Star Medal on Guadalcanal for pulling two of his own men out of an ambush. So, <laughs> right. and it's sort of like anything. And then he was a doctor, and then and so it's just like uh, he would just make these grand proclamations. Literally, everyone called him Judge. That was his nickname because they had so much respect for him. Oh wow! So it's just like no one's looking at me and going, you know. Like, if I proclaim anything, like, in general, it's not heard. Like, I'm, like no one stops talking when I proclaim stuff. So I, yeah, I just I can't. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't execute I like that he was, already a, he was already a doctor, but... They called him Jeff. That, that wasn't good. Right. That wasn't right. en- enough of an, a term of esteem. For that. <laughs> uh, doctor Judge? Yeah. Like, uh-huh. Judge, Silver Star winner. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, what's, what's interesting is you... Sometimes the inclination is, well, I like the way I turned out, or th- that's right. the thought. Like, well, you know, I went to Jesuit school where there were only there were staircases you couldn't walk up and sk- staircases you couldn't walk down, and <laughs> I'm great. I <laughs> like I I forget. It's like I look past every single one of my problems and go like, well, all in all, I think I turned out as <laughs> functional as a person can turn out. I'm, I'm exactly the same way, and I have I share many of the same problems and issues that you've gone through, and I, I do the same thing where I'm like, well, look at me. I'm fine. You know, and yeah, it's, only, right, it's yeah. only because there are the Dan Levy's out there who are saying, you know how much he made on TED? I'm like, I'm yeah, doing yeah. great. If you have a hype man, if you have a financial hype man like Dan Levy, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Honestly, have Dan Levy talk to your children, Goldie. <laughs> <laughs> right. oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> that would be a great cure. Now, we talked about it a little bit. So, you know, from early on, you kind of wanted to be a stand up. But what stand up did you watch or listen to growing up that you remember kind of making an impression on you? Oh, um, well, I was one of those kids who there were the big ones, you know like George Carlin. And then uh, as I got into high school, Chris Rock and a lot of the Mount Rushmore people I could name, but sure. I was one of those kids who liked every comedian at a certain point. I remember watching comic strip live and evening at the improv. And yeah, I, it was rare. I didn't find someone funny or that I didn't enjoy laughing <laughs> when the audience laughed. Like it was, I remember um, this comedian, Dennis Wolfberg, uh, yeah. Very funny guy. He had big eyes, yep. and uh, he um, like he. I, I loved. I loved George Wallace also. Yes, uh, that was. He was. He you had can a, see that in your work. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> he um, he had like a refillable bit about stupid people. Uh, <laughs> maybe the maybe the most refillable bit ever. He goes, yeah. you know, that he hates stupid people. <laughs> yep. And um, so relatable. It was a joke that he told that I went into school the next day and told, which was um, I was at the airport. I can't I can't stand stupid people. I was at the airport. I, I told a woman my flight leaves at noon. She said twelve noon. I said no, two noon, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> You told that must school. have been huge in the Jesuit school. <laughs> it was great, and also, um, it, you know, right off the right off the bat, you believe I was at the airport the day before. <laughs> <laughs> so they're in from there. Now, I want to go back to something you said about Jesuit school and staircases you could go up and couldn't go up. What does that mean? There were at my high school on one side of the building a staircase you could walk up. And on the other side of the building, a staircase, you could walk down. You couldn't, if you were going up the stairs and you forgot something, you couldn't double back. You had to walk across the building to the staircase you could walk down. Wow. Uh, It's a small thing, but it... (laughs) Memorable. It it really, uh, it it adds a level of difficulty to life that at that age is just impossible. It's just... The feeling of moving upstairs and going, 
I need one thing. <laughs> and I will and I will get jug, which is what we call detention, which stood for justice under God. Oh, oh wow. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, if I turn back, um, if I turn back on this staircase. Oh, and wow. my shirt being tucked in is an endless source of stress. Yeah. Uh, but wow. and yet you are you I feel like you're your shirt is always tucked in. Is that why? Is that what you're saying? I don't wear shirts unless I'm wearing a suit because I'm scared of it coming untucked. <laughs> Still, <laughs> because of the jug. Oh it, was, my. it was just a, yeah, it was just a nightmare. Oh, so, yeah. so you carry that Jesuit experience into a Jesuit college experience. Oh. Uh, yeah, I really, jo- I really escaped by <laughs> right. going to. So Although, you- honestly, like, it was, it was interesting. I mean, a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds go to Georgetown. So it's yeah. definitely not just Catholic kid. The first time you turned around in a staircase in college, what did that feel Ooh. like? <laughs> rebel, rebel. Shirt tail blowing in the wind. <laughs> Georgetown felt completely like the high school I'd been at was so strict and Catholic. Georgetown felt completely secular. Yeah. Like I remember like, someone saying, it's kind of weird that some of the older classrooms have a cross on the wall. And I was like, what? Like <laughs> people are getting up and opening the window when they feel like it. Like, like, <laughs> this is a paradise of free thinking. So, okay. So you're, you're at Georgetown and uh, which I believe was your parents' alma mater. And they were, yeah. there, they were there with Bill Clinton. I'm not yeah, saying you're. There. I'm not saying you're a Nepo college baby. I, I, just, I wanted to get to I the am. Bill Clinton thing. Um, oh yeah, you had a very funny story in uh, in one of your specials uh, about that, where you your mom used you as a human shield at some function, so that you were able to to meet Bill Clinton, and that that really did happen, right? Yep, that okay. happened. They, so they went to Georgetown. Um, my parents were, I think, three years behind Bill in college. But then they, my parents both went to Yale Law School, not to follow each other. They will <laughs> always make Safe. a point of telling. <laughs> um, <laughs> not because we were in love, but because it was the best school. It was just like, oh, you get it. I got it. Um, and Hillary and Bill were both there. Uh, wow. And that story happened. Sorry, my my mom had her closest, almost uh, I don't know, almost make out with Bill Clinton <laughs> in New Haven. And oh, okay, uh, okay, there was a period of time from the late '80s to 2000 where my parents had some kind of personal beef with everyone in the news. Like (laughs) from the time uh, Robert Bork was nominated to the Supreme Court and got shot down, he'd been their professor. Oh, wow. So they were like, so, you know, they were like, ah, they were so stressed at all of his bad answers. (laughs) And they were like, you know, Judge Bork isn't handling this well. And that was like, and then, and then Clarence Thomas had been their classmate. Oh, oh boy. Wow. So they had a lot to say about that. And yeah. then Bill and Hillary. God. Uh, they really Bill skipped Hillary. through history. Yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it was a little Forrest Gump of a situation. Yeah. yeah. Smarter Forrest Gumps. And then in, in, in 2000, or when George W. Bush was elected, he named that guy John Bolton. Yeah. Uh, yeah. His cabinet, maybe. And uh, I it said he was Yale Law School class of 74. Four, which is or 73, which was my parents' year. So I asked my dad, uh, do you know John Bolton? He goes, yeah, yeah, I, I, I knew him well. He has a, he has a big mustache. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> very well, very well. That's, that's all anyone <laughs> knows clearly about known. him. <laughs> <laughs> but so one of the other uh, cool things about Georgetown was that you met uh, Nick Kroll. And the best thing about George. <laughs> right. And now well, Nick, we, you know, I'm sure all our fans know who he is incredibly funny uh, comedian, performer, actor. Um, but I have to say, uh, at first glance, you two seem quite different in in terms of uh, the way that you present your comedy, let's say. Whereas Nick is like this sort of, he's just a natural clown in the best sense. Like he he comes on stage, you're already just laughing. Um, oh, whereas yeah. I, did you, do you feel like that your kind of differences drew you together or did you realize you had more in common than you thought? We had so many influences in common. You know, we were both, we both just kind of found Zero Mostel and the producers to be like maybe the highest 
point of art ever. <laughs> right. uh, I, I think a cardboard belt might be my favorite comic thing. I'm, I'm wearing a cardboard belt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, pretty sure that Nick Kroll, I, I'm pretty sure his first LLC was called Cardboard Belt. Oh, wow. Oh, look at his that. His first oh, LLC. Oh, first. God. Talk to Dan Levy. Yeah. When your accountant tells you you need a, a company uh, for VH1 Best Week Ever money. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, it might have been Cardboard Belt. Or maybe it was I want that money. <laughs> Which he just, you know, right at it. Right at, at one it. point, I want that money. <laughs> um, but going so, to Georgetown, I, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you, but are you like hedging your bets at that point? Like, so I can pursue comedy there because of you know sound mind and a sound body, and there's a Jesuit thing of like you're allowed to pursue this elective. But I'm really gonna be you know a diplomat. Oh, no, point. no, no. I, I was not on the foreign service school track at all. I was, I, I'll, I don't remember exactly. I think it, I, well, I know. I, I said, this is the best school I've gotten into. And my dad said to me, um, I was deciding between college. He goes, look, I know you don't want to go where I went. And I know you feel weird about going where your mom and I went, but it's the best school. And it's like a, it's an extremely interesting environment to be in. Hmm. And uh, I'm glad he told me that because it, while I wasn't, I wasn't making the most of what the, the university has to offer. Um, it was, you know, Madeline Albright was teaching on campus. You'd wow. see like really great people were coming to lecture there or give special lectures. It was really interesting to be around that, you know, a, a, a diplomacy government think tank of a school. It was really interesting to be around. And what I didn't realize, uh, but was very grateful for was like Nick and I's improv group was the only game in town. It wasn't like uh, right. Emerson where I think you have to be in a sketch group to get in. <laughs> it, it was like we were the only thing. We were the only comedy. The only thing. That's um, the best. What was the name of the comedy group? Georgetown Players. Ah. Oh, good for you for keeping it classy and not yeah. some, I mean ridiculous pun <laughs> oh no 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 because there was no it was like we were like it might as well we were the georgetown comedy group there was no need for like uh all the acapella groups had like oh you know, uh funky names but that's we what it was when i went was those were the comedy groups because in between songs they would like rip off snl bits oh i mean this was in the wow. night early 90s like comedy kind of didn't exist yet as we right. know it Right. It, it wasn't like you couldn't break out of the acapella group. You ha it was like if you're gonna do some comedy, you also have to sing Uptown Girl. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just isn't enough for the audience, you know, unless they're hearing, you that know, do like Diddy or something. That's a delightful evening you've just described. <laughs> no, people loved it, and I hated my best friend. And I hated it in college, but it sounds like you had. Did you, you didn't form that group. I mean, that group I assume existed and people passed through or did you form it? Oh, no, no, I didn't form it. It had been formed, but but it had been formed fairly recently by um, Mike Berbiglia and a few people. Oh yeah, well, that's cool. got good roots. All right, yeah. all right so, so you and Nick are buddies. You're in this group. When, when did the germ of Oh Hello get created? Because it felt like something that you guys had come upon years before and would just riff on and then it were like let's turn this into a show um yeah it uh i don't mean to brag i don't mean to sound narrative-y but like i think from the very beginning that was it would we were just into very lame adults uh, <laughs> very early and people who say like you want some something to eat like we just <laughs> Um, I remember him telling me that, uh, like, I was just trying to remember the context for the story, but he was in a locker room and some older guy said to another older guy, like, you're not going to steam. I thought you were King Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's enough. King Schmidt was just the idea of like, sin sincerely being like, but you're King Schmidt. Like, get in. I, I mean, JC. Can you put this picture up? I just want to yes. show you. This was my poetry professor at Columbia University. And I I feel like you... <laughs> His name was Kenneth Koch. And he was like a well-known New York poet. But 
when I watch George wow. St. Gilgood, I'm like, this, <laughs> you, this is the guy. <laughs> oh, my God. It really is. Also, you look can how pretty his glasses are. <laughs> really yeah. Are. And oh, he God. was just, you know, the person. He, he was very kind of like inspirational, actually. But it, there was also the element of like the class was always, you know, 12 very attractive young women and then two promising <laughs> literature majors, you know, of which I guess I, I yeah. qualified as one. And, and, and that's, even, a, yeah. that's an awesome likeness. Can you put that back up? Absolutely. That, now, tell me if I'm wrong. That, I know you can't see this at home. That's Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't what? it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it is. And, and Eleanor Roosevelt, not an attractive woman, but as a man, looks okay. <laughs> Yes, dapper. She was, she was in the wrong gig her whole life. All right, you can get, get. It's good to know that no one knows how to take a photo. Like <laughs> a, 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 um, a fair island, a fair isle sweater, a scarf, <laughs> and maybe leaning against carpet. <laughs> this we're good it to go. Like that. Oh Here, my god! Lean, like I mean, we've all done the lean. <laughs> oh god! I'm so I envy that you've done the lean. No one's asked me to lean. The the, the, the the thing I remember the first day that was very funny that he said was, "Don't bring me any poems about noble homeless people." Because <laughs> like, I guess every year people would, you know, there was one guy who was always panhandling, like right at the gates of Columbia, and he was singing a song, and he had a cup, and he would do a rhythm. And I guess people must just come in with poems ever, like, you know, shakes might not look like a lot to you. <laughs> oh, God. We oh. had a writing professor in college that taught playwriting and screenwriting, and it was, uh, it was just tailor-made to get way too invested in his approval. And uh, <laughs> <Right>. I remember <laughs> it was just, it was like, cause like, like That's I said. That's so perfect. The, That's such a perfect observation. The arts were, the arts were a small component of Georgetown. So like, there's only, there's only one class where you want to thrive. And it was just, it was, um, it was a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember in the middle of class once he was talking about uh, the, the clock menace threat, whatever he was talking Whatever, whatever screen uh, playwriting device he was talking about, he said, because each of us can only live day by day. And then he said, unless you're Mulaney, and then you live minute to minute. And I no. thought that was so, I thought it was a compliment. And I was like, no. You're like, thank you. <laughs> you're always in a scramble. Oh. <laughs> Hey, but you were singled out by this guy. The, the having that, a spot I know on. that's yes. what's lame. Is that's what I like. I was like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah he very notices relatable me, to me. Too. The rascal. Me. Uh, so now let's talk about SNL for a little bit. Uh, as maybe you know, Goldie and I have a complicated history with that show, but we love it, and that's what drives us insane. But did you have an appreciation when you were going through that experience of how great it was? Or did it take some time to like look back and say, you know what, that was fucking awesome? Uh, no, I, I knew immediately. So it was, I mean, I think the the biggest source of stress is that you you tell everyone that you got hired. So like, yeah. you know, like a lot of writing jobs, we don't know. People come and go and get let go after it. But like it's like a gender reveal party. Like you tell your whole family and everyone yeah. knows you. Like I lived in New York, so at least I wasn't uprooting or anything. Yeah. I remember talking to Dan Mintz on the phone, um, very funny comedian and writer. And he and I had just been writing at this show, Important Things with Dimitri Martin. And right. then I was hired as a writer at SNL. And the night before my first day, I was like, this is going to be a bad year. Like, this is going to be tough. Like, yeah. you know, I read the oral history. It's yeah. going to be really cold and competitive and everyone's going to be, you know, Ellen Cleghorn's going to try to stab me in the back and all this. Stuff. <laughs> and, and Dan said, he goes, yeah, but like, you know, if you get fired, no one will remember that. They'll just go, oh, John worked at SNL once. So like, it's yeah. okay if you get fired. And I was like, That's great. because all these people, they write for Letterman and SNL and they get fired. And like, no one ever talks about that. They were fired. And I was like, okay, that's a good way. So I went in it being is. like, this is going to be hard. I'll keep my head down. But I, but it's like, you know, whatever. You Had know? you tried for Letterman at that point? Did no, I submit never Letterman? submitted a Letterman packet. Um, I was once doing stand up at Gotham Comedy Club. Yeah. Uh, just like I went up, did a set, got off stage, and then kind of found out it had been a Letterman showcase for Eddie Brill. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
So he pulled me aside into a room. I was like, what is I, like, I just came to do a set and leave. And he was like, so looking at your set, you know, uh, Dave would never like your comedy. <laughs> Yay. I'm, I'm in the middle of my, like, I, I have another to get to. Like, I didn't need to be pulled aside and told that. He goes, you do too many act outs. Dave wouldn't like that. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, uh, God. Yeah, no, that, that Conan was the one I submitted to a couple times. To that write makes for. sense. Yeah. 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 No, well, Conan was hilarious, especially, I mean, Goldie and I. That was were, my show. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Much more. Same. Yeah. I remember their, God, their third anniversary special was like one of the funniest things I had ever seen. I just remember what, taping it uh, off of, you know, on a, on a VHS tape and watching that over and over. Was, was that so when fun. he came out in a top hat and tails? I think that was the one that started with him like running through the city and then he ultimately jumps off Chelsea Pier into the water. Oh, not the one where they're running through the city and everyone's joining him. Maybe that was the 10th year special. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's joining them and it's like this bigger, you know, like the- Rocky get too. And, and then, yeah, everyone's running along with him. And then- That one I remember, yeah. Uh, and then I think it's Ian Roberts plays a, one of the guys in the crowd and he goes, hey, look, it's David Lee Roth. And they cut to David <laughs> Lee Roth who lowers his sunglasses and smiles. Rat. And the entire crowd feels <laughs> away from going in the fight. That's a very Conan. Joke. No, those anniversary, those Conan anniversaries were such a big deal because, like, I was so invested. It was the first time I knew about ratings and a show. Like, you know, the show was just famously in trouble in the beginning. <laughs> and my older brother and I were so invested in it, and yeah. I remember like probably the third anniversary, and Conan's on the cover of Rolling Stone with like super high hair, yeah. Yeah. and I was like, we did it. <laughs> that's amazing and is that we like white irish men we did it <laughs> let's not make it about <laughs> but, um it was I, I think it was like my my commitment to this show must right. have pushed it over viewers the okay all right the that's viewer. the way no because yeah. i mean i'll watch gary shandling and say we did it and it's a little bit of a judaism thing. you know the curb your enthusiasm i'm like we're still doing it right sure sure yes. sure yeah we're and still, you're <laughs> we're still doing it. <laughs> we're still doing it somehow <laughs> but then when i when i first was in new york and did stand up on conan i was amazed by i was like everyone here is like most of the writers here are white Irish and also like seven feet tall. Yes. <laughs> That's like a... Mike Sweeney was tall. Yeah. Uh, is it, was it Kevin Dorff? He was like, these guys well, there were was like, a Brian like, Stack giant. Oh, Brian Stack. Yes. <laughs> of course. Huge. The tallest person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny. Family guy has oddly tall and American writers. dad too. Yeah. Uh, so family guy, we have like, Two six five writers, a six four writer, six three, six two, and I remember because tall people love like on the first day, like when everybody's meeting in a writers room, they love to ask how tall you are. <laughs> yeah. like, it just gets that conversation out of the that way. That being said, we also have a small ball lineup we go to. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, for, for the, the 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 front liners can rest at the end of the first quarter. No, but so we had this conversation the first day we were all at Family Guy together. How tall are you? How tall are you? One of the writers, Tom Devani, who's like 6'3 himself, asked how tall I was. And I said, I'm 5'11. And he goes, uh, that's 5'10. And I, I was laughing and I go, you're right. But how the fuck would you know that? And he goes, anyone 5'11 would just say six feet. Oh, <laughs> that's you great. Unlock something that's 100% accurate. Um, but let's get back to SNL. Sorry for that sidetrack about my height. It's like 5'10 and a half, really. Um, but it, so SNL... I've always found that people love to have an opinion about SNL. It's awful or it's amazing. Those are the sort of the two opinions that they have. And I feel like, and maybe you can speak to this, the difference is one sketch. If, if, the, if an SNL has only one funny sketch, people will say, that God, that sucked. If it has two funny sketches, they will say, it's the fucking greatest. It's totally back. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you noticed like what the sort of quotient is for people to really love an, uh, an episode of SNL? Well, I really do hope people look at them as full episodes. I know that that's changed a lot, a lot. Yeah. And even by the time I was there, it was starting to become, you know, people watching it online on right. as well. So first off, I think people's like, people are just talking about their own lives 
when they talk about how SNL <laughs> isn't good or was good. Like, so true. oh, really? You enjoyed something more at 17 <laughs> right. than you do at 47? And things were, oh, the cast was so much better. That, like, right. That's so true. Yeah, you know, Tim um, Kazarinski. You're, you're just charting. Yeah, like, you know, you're just... With some rare exceptions where I think, you know, what real fans will be like, no, despite the fact that I was 20 and vibrant, that, you know, that, Listen, that one thing was pretty difficult. I maintain live performing from the album Lakini's Juice was the best <laughs> musical act to ever <laughs> grace the stage at SNL. And, and it has nothing to do with my full head of hair as I watched it. <laughs> no, I mean, I thought once standing on the floor watching the musical guests, I was like, why don't we do anything fun anymore like Fishbone? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Right. And G Goldie, tell, uh, tell John who your favorite SNL host of all time is. Oh, Donald Trump. Oh. <laughs> That's true. It's I just something I say when it comes yeah. up. He loves to say that to be confrontational. And, and, you, and you break down his episode from the early 2000s and the more recent one, and you go, Yeah, I mean, it's just, he just <laughs> knocked it out of the park. I mean, he should be there once a year. It should be you know. a residency. Um, no, but then in terms of people, like what makes people come back? Yeah. I mean, people will, you know, they, feel like it's it's just made for listicles snl obviously so yeah. you finish off a season and they do a, the top 10 sketches and there were like 20 times there were 160 sketches and yes. like it just breaks down if you have a good 10 if you have 10 take-homes yeah that's a great season nuts. yeah i mean i i i think most seasons you break them down and you go uh, oh, the Bo and Yang's uh, iceberg, like j just yes. a couple things and people are. Right, right. Yeah. All but it's again. also, it's also to me like, um, I think people look at it as a utility and you can only be disappointed with the utility. Like, <laughs> right. That's we're confusing. not, we're not Apple computers where we go, here's, here it is. That's, Always this working. is the phone and we, and you're going to like it. You know, yeah. we're like the post office, like <laughs> we're, we're viewed as the post office, like. You know what you're supposed to get. You have some vision in your mind, and we can only <laughs> right. to meet or not meet that. Um, now, let's since we're talking about SNL, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, friendship with Bill Hader because I find it it's so awesome to watch. I watched uh, your your interview of him from the 92nd Street Y, which was hysterical. And one of the things yeah. I I love about watching you two is that. He is so absolutely delighted by your comedy. Like he's because I feel like some performers and funny people like to kind of withhold their laughter a little bit like they, you know, they don't give it out really that freely. But I feel like you see Bill Hader completely unlocked by whatever it is you do mm -hmm. to him. So talk a little bit about how you two met and connected on SNL. Well, you're dead on in that Bill is. um we have a real, we just really found a harmony really quickly. And yeah. he's a very generous laugher. And honestly, I think Bill, I look back on like, you know, Nick and Mike Birbiglia really showed me how to be a comedian and do it. And and Bill helped me so much by, he always like publicly credited the stuff we wrote together. Yes. It, it made, it was like, it made a, huge huge impact on you know work i was able to do later so uh awesome. but we met very first day well we'd met once before through dimitri martin or something um but we we met matt when i was hired and i pitched something to michael phelps the underwater guy <laughs> right um, <laughs> the, under, the depressed underwater guy yes we know him. well he yeah he loves it down there um, <laughs> hates it up here. like to be on dry land. He yeah, hates <laughs> it up here. Loves it. Hates it up here. <laughs> um, too dry. Too dry. Uh, well, I, a, a Mark Spitz talk show that was called "Put on the Spitz," and <laughs> it was just it was sold. Yeah, sold of course. And, and um, Andy Samberg came up to me and was like, "I do a Mark Spitz," you know. <laughs> Which so the best thing about SNL is just people go like. I do a Mark Spitz. Uh, yes. <laughs> Why, yes, I have a Hal Holbrook. Yeah, no, really, being like, I, I, I can do Charles Durning. I, I can do it. Um, so uh, 
uh, then I thought, well, should his musical, should his uh, band leader be Elliot Spitzer and the Schizophrenic? <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> and then so me, Andy and Bill and Brian Tucker worked that okay. night on this sketch. It was my first writing night ever. Cool. And I just fucking laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> like it was so fun. Awesome. And oh. Bill's Elliot Spitzer was one of my favorite <laughs> impressions that never really took off. We we tried to get it to be, you know, like a, a James Carville, one he could do a lot, but people weren't really biting. We just found Spitzer so funny. And, <laughs> um, I remember one line is, Andy, as Mark Spitz goes, hey, Elliot, how's that whole thing going with you? And he goes, it's the thing that will not die. And then <laughs> plays a big keyboard chord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and from good. then we just worked, then we just, I think we wrote something every week. I mean, I know we wrote something every week from then on. That's I just, so awesome. Well, it was like meeting a person who could who could actually do, he and Fred were like, I was like, oh, these things that I can't perform. I don't have that skill. Um, it's like writing for the best instruments in the world. I know. For the people is... from important things calling you and going, how's it going over at SNL? We, uh... I, uh, <laughs> no, no, they, no. The, Dimitri was also great about it. I, I, I had some like 1940s vision of show business where like, I'm like, but I have a contract with Dimitri. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's not going to let me out. That's and I remember sweet. calling him and asking for permission well, to go to D Dimitri in many ways, like he's the prototype not not for you at all but he's the prototype for the writer getting in front of the camera of that generation I feel like like he was on Conan as a writer and then he just became like too big and as a stand-up like similar to you I feel you know on SNL where it was like eventually you just had enough of your own following that you did your own thing I mean yeah, Dimitri had a Dimitri won the um, Edinburgh Fringe Festival and then was hired at Conan. So like it was like we all knew about the hot, you know, the hire. Yeah. And but did you? This, I I did want to ask you about this stand up wise because this never happened to me, and I'm wondering if at what point in your career this happened. But when did you start to get fans of you? Not just like people in the audience who were grooving on your comedy, but did you? Did was there a, like a moment where you thought? oh my God, there's now like 30 people to see me all of a sudden where it used to just be I was performing at a comedy show. Yeah, I, the, the first couple of times I headlined a club, um, I think the Houston, the Houston Laugh Stop was the first club I ever headlined in 2007. And that was like, um, that was like, I had enough credits, like, or I had one credit, I'd been on Best Week, I was on Best Week Ever. So it was like from, so that allowed the club to go, all right, at least he's been on TV. And then, but people who came were just people who would come to the right. comedy. Um, I had a, uh, you know, I think around 2008, I had a Comedy Central half hour special and I had a CD out. I had an album out. Awesome. Um, and that, I, I think that's kind of when it started where some people at least were there on purpose. Right. But then uh, I did an hour special uh, for Comedy Central in 2010, 2011. And after that, after that, I I, I, I knew that I, I remember I was doing the DC improv and I knew I couldn't do the jokes from the special because people had seen it and oh, were wow. there. Oh, uh, that's wow. interesting. Yeah. It's funny. Comedy Central, just the, the mention of it. It's like. Comedy Central is sort of like the producer with the or the record executive with the RV at the beginning of that thing you do. It's like they're sort of the junkie producer who's like, I'm going to hand you off to Tom Hanks now and you're gonna go to SNL and do all the fancy yes. stuff. Um, but God bless Comedy Central. I used to watch that. Oh, oh my God. All the Comedy time. Central. Comedy Central was like, I mean, I was also an assistant there for a year. So like it, mm. it felt like. There was a moment that felt like the center of the universe in 2002, 2003. It was, yes. And before too. Yeah. With all yeah, those before, shows. But also it just like, I mean, oh my God. The, yeah. They had it all going I'd on. I'd go there. to tapings, a tough crowd and just be like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, so back to uh, you and Bill Hader for a minute, because uh, I'm sure all of our fans know the hysterical Stefan bits that you did on uh, for weekend update. And, 
Talk a little bit about the so the the gimmick there that people sort of became aware of, especially people in the comedy know is, oh, Bill hasn't seen these lines and Mulaney is writing this stuff and oh my God, look at him just cracking up in real time in front of millions of people. Uh, and it was it was fucking fantastic. So how did you guys first decide to try that? Um, I'm glad you I'm glad you found it funny. Like I always was <laughs> we were always a little like our comedy people a little like fuck you like fuck you. <laughs> oh no no that's <laughs> like oh your break oh he makes you break it 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 was both true and it felt a little too cute of a. We were seething with jealousy at the friendship, <laughs> the acclaim, and the quality. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Take that. But listen, I, I like the 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 notion of like breaking's okay in this case. We were very yes. conflicted on because it was genuine. He yes. there would be a couple jokes in it that he hadn't seen, or just like um a rhythm thing, like putting Dan Cortez in yes. again and again and again. And <laughs> yep. he would Break and and that all just that all started with the reality of SNL where you're putting in changes incredibly late yeah and running up to the perform the the cast member on the floor and whispering in their ear like okay you're no longer Mark Consuelos so when you get out there it's gonna say hi uh, I'm Ryan Reynolds like whatever it was right right, right. Um, that started with that but everything in Stefan was so stupid and uh, <laughs> absurd that. The, se- the severity with which I'd say, okay, I changed that to a cleaning woman who looks like Smokey Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, that, and that is a great example. And you brought up Dan Cortez. And when you said that, I was wondering, did, did Bill or you ever hear from Dan Cortez after that? I don't think so. <laughs> it would have been nice for him to, to, to reach out and say thanks for remembering me because nobody else does. He literally could have had a renaissance off that if he played that right. I'm yeah, not I even know. kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I uh, the the late and great Taylor Negron I met uh, after we'd used him in a Stefan. I can't remember what it was. Taylor Negron was at one of the clubs. Yeah. Um, and I met <laughs> him everything. and said... You know, I I hope you don't mind. Uh, we uh, had your name in a Stefan, and he said, "I know. I was watching, and I was in my home. And right after you said they said my name, do you ever, when you're alone, just kind of look to camera?" <laughs> <laughs> what a line! I know, That's great. <laughs> um, and and I wanted speaking of what a line, and you just brought up the Smokey Robinson thing is hysterical, but I wanted to bring up just because we're writers here and I wanted to acknowledge how hilarious I thought this one particular observation was about a club that has everything. And one of the things is a doorman who always high fives children of divorce. (laughs) (laughs) That, that, That to me, like I was absolutely blown away by that when it happened. And when I was building up to this interview, I was watching more of that stuff and I was like, there's that fucking line. And was that, I mean, can you even remember? Was that just like, hey, we have a show in 30 minutes. We got to think of a line. Or do you remember anything about that? that no, no, that, that one's pretty deep in my, that, that, that notion <laughs> was pretty deep in my bones from growing up. That there was always like, hey, little man. Like there was, always, <laughs> there was always like, you know. Uh, He's the father figure. Yeah. And he needs a little cheering, you know, like a, yeah. he needs a little cheering up. This is yeah. quite uh quite a trauma to go through contentious and it's contentious it's contentious and you know he saw the father move out and yeah, he got sweet. lots of opinions but always the high five sweet. Uh, no that was like that was that was deep in my dna as a thing <laughs> so uh, funny the rule I feel like stuff- you could do it each of these lines go through each of them with you <laughs> were there infinite amount of time and what like that could be a podcast <laughs> i know, I know. Anyway, that I felt that I to go back to your fear of at least from my perspective, like did comedy people look at it like fuck you guys? No, I and I and I know what you're saying about breaking on SNL and the totally. Andy, the Andy Samberg thing. Honestly, was a little bit annoying to me watching it, uh, and even and Fallon going back to Fallon, Andy where they would break and and chuckle. And I would kind of say like, oh, Fallon's doing this on purpose because he knows he's so fucking adorable. <laughs> but with with Bill, you get the sense that he is more of, shall we say, like an artiste, 
about what he does. So for him to break, it felt like this is more earned. Yeah. When, and, and of course, the material that you were breaking him with was so funny to me as a viewer anyway, that I, I agreed with him breaking. Yeah, we um, the part of the fun for me was that Bill has this great son of Oklahoma work ethic. And <laughs> yeah. he was he was genuinely apologetic after each one like i'm right. sorry man <laughs> it's like i was doing it but yeah. he was like really like i'm sorry man i just i fucking lost it and uh we would really always go it. to the dinner after the show um some call it a party but it's just mm-hmm. writers having late. dinner with their parents who flew <laughs> very late dinner <laughs> and we went we would always go up and apologize to lauren just to gauge like is he like you fucking cutesy guys think this is so. And he was like, the things you're saying are actually funny. So I'm He's right. right. He's right. He was right about that. Um, now let's switch gears from something good to uh, something else. You're, you're talking to right now um, two of the people who are most responsible for the sitcom dads in this world, or you're looking at them right here. Um, and we had, we had amazing actors really funny writer's room, and we failed spectacularly. And so I wanted to talk to you about, in your in your feeling, like, where did the show Mulaney not turn out right? Like, wh- where did oh it God. kind of, like, miss what you wanted it to be? Um, all, all on me. Um, all on me. Some, uh, where did it miss what I wanted? Um, the realities of production. And um, being going from being a sketch writer who was inside Thirty Rock, right. fiercely protected, protected by, by a castle, prote- no, and fiercely protected by Lauren in a way that yes. I didn't realize till we left. I mean, Lauren would yell at Jeff Zucker like <laughs> in front of us. Like I had uh, no idea what it was like to um, really get notes and really, and beyond just getting notes. The, Every, every part of it, I, I did not know what it would be like to run a show. And I, and I luckily had uh, John Pollock with me, who's yep. a wonderful, oh, yeah. wonderful guy He's and a great deep. writer, and, um, was really patient with me figuring out those frustrations. But I was on the phone too goddamn much. I was, I was, I wanted to be like, I should have just tried to get the this exact tone onto the page and onto the screen. But I was also like, I felt like a cruise ship director, like right. personnel. And I was, it was just such a massive thing that I, um, I just lost the thread somewhere, you know, yeah. it was, Seems it was, uh, but we had really funny jokes. We had great writers. The table reads were, you know, I, I, I can trace it on a micro level from table read to the show we would turn in. Yeah, because that and was I, the issue with dads too. I wrote 20, but also I wrote like 29 minute episodes and then it'd be the funniest table read any of us had been at. And then I just didn't realize that I'm cutting the eight minutes that made, you know, all of us delighted right. because I'm tracking a story because I'm tracking a story that we've, you know, gotten approved from Universal and Fox over the course of the week. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just, I think just inexperience and um and not understanding the job. I remember I went to dinner with Lauren Michaels, who produced it right before I went out to start production on the Fox show. And I told him I went, I'm really just gonna run this the way Matt and Trey run South Park. Like I was like, I like how they're just out in Marina Del Rey. They don't talk to anyone. They don't interact with anyone. That's nice. And Lauren right. stared at me and he went, do you realize you're you're running for Congress? He's like, this show is like, like you're, you're doing a network uh, half hour. Like this wow, is, yeah. this is involves so much, you know, it involves so many logistics, so many right. people you have diplomacy to Diplomacy and yeah, just. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, a theory about your show and dad's a, a little bit too, in terms of subject matter that like, we were looking backwards, raised on, on the Seinfeld cheers model or whatever that like, 
these people were adults in adult situations on the show, right? And I, when I was watching it, it was like, Seinfeld is who I want to be. It's like, or even George, to an extent, was kind of like this misanthrope in the city going More around and yeah. sort of being a dick in the office and then dating, whatever. But like, right as these shows came out, people really started getting into their phones, and it ruined if had phones been around in Seinfeld, it, it would you can ruin any episode of Seinfeld with a cell phone. Like the restaurant, it's like they just look up a different restaurant or whatever. The soup Nazi won't let me in. It's like, well, I'll door dash the soup or get a task right. Like <laughs> right. and I think we were again canary in a coal mine of like story wise, we were writing these stories in a way that people were no longer quite living anymore because they were in now it's just, people are just an extension of their phone. And we were writing stories that were like what we were raised on, which kind of weren't quite, they were two years untrue, I feel. That's oh, interesting. a hundred percent. Sudeikis always had this idea, uh, I wish we'd done it at SNL, which was just cheers with phones. And like, <laughs> everyone's just, I mean, everyone's I mean, just on their phone. Like it's just, yeah. <laughs> the whole That'd be amazing. And every, no one's talking and everyone's on their phone. Um, I think that you're absolutely right. Like I was, there was an additional element that I added, which was some of the only tightly wound interpersonal types of storylines are dating and uh, sex based. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want dating on the show. Like that's that's what the other multis do. And we're going to have, you know, one of the apartments is haunted and we set up a camera to catch the ghost. But we see our roommate master, but we're going to have these like, yeah, I wanted like Sergeant Bilko kind of plot. <laughs> right. We're like, we all, and you know, <laughs> we decide to have an apartment dance and everyone, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it just was, um, yeah, it was, it was that thing of like, here's what we're not going to do. And then, you know, we got into like, I mean, but I liked it. I liked where we, I liked what we did and I liked where we went, but it does, um, it does limit uh, yeah. half hour storytelling, I think. Right. Did you get the sense at the time uh, when the show was out that there was an element of like people or critics that were waiting for something like this with you? Like, did, did, did it feel like people were unnecessarily mean to you in, the, in their <laughs> reviews? Um, I found it, uh, I found it pretty aggressive. But I didn't feel like I had a target on my back. I because it was twofold. I I realized that people who sort of liked where I came from were disappointed. But I also found out that most people had no idea who I was. So <laughs> <laughs> it was like it's the worst spot. of both worlds. No one in LA, like no one in the town seemed to like the town. No, yeah. no one in the, I'm gonna own it. No one in the town <laughs> yeah. is yeah, yeah. to, you know, um care or be like, yeah, but we're gonna be behind him because we think that wasn't happening. And then also uh people who were like, We we like what we've seen you do at SNL and stand up were like, this is too broad. So I not enough people knew me, and those who did were thrown by it. Yeah. Um the uh I mean, there is uh I remember Marika Sawyer, who wrote with me on the show and has written many other amazing things. Um, she did say to me when the reviews were so awful and directed at me, she's like, I know that you know that this is funny. And I was like, I do know. I That's... know this is funny. <laughs> right. Yes. Like, I, I do appreciate that. This is hard, but I, I do know how funny it is. Right. Yeah, it feels like we are due for a think piece on reconsidering your show that someone will go back and go, Hey, it's actually good. Like I, I do feel like that could happen. Yeah. Um, Would you yeah, do it? I mean, <laughs> I, I've always, I, I won't pretend I haven't thought about that. I won't pretend. I <laughs> yeah. and, but, but in what I'm publication like, real, be careful what you wish for. I'm like, it might be, uh, it might be a wobbly show. Uh, but there were s- I don't know. I mean, Elliot Gould coming into our apartment and saying, does anyone know how to get a turquoise ring out of a VCR? Like that. (laughs) That's just funny. That's just funny. It's just funny to me. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, there were, there were, yeah. Yeah. Um, It it was an interesting time. Was there, was there any particular reason that it was on Fox and not NBC? Was that a story? Yeah. um, uh, Bob Greenblatt passed on it. It was, it was done 
as a pilot called uh, Mulaney Don't Drink. Uh, and it was about me quitting drinking and drugs and deciding I really want to become a good person. But had Martin Short, Elliot, yep. Seam, and Seaton, and was a similar show, but had actually had something to it. And when we went, when Fox, which was amazing that after a pilot passed on, was able to go, uh, Universal brought it to Fox and Kevin Riley bid on it, which is amazing. The, the discussion was like, but lose the quitting drinking part. Uh, <laughs> the story yeah. is the thought... one thing that's really going to give it the resonance with, because I hear that and I go, that's like, I just go, that's great. Like, yeah, it should be Mulaney don't drink. Like, yeah, and it's and it's like these are you know how do we you know like we are rec I'm, I'm a reckless person. Uh, it felt a lot more in tune with who I was, which right. is like a pretty sunny person who has st strange dark sides. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, you know, just has like has has had some uh, real dark spots, and so but. As as development of the new show happened, I was kind of like trying to be an A student and uh, I wanted it to get on. I, so, and of I course. also thought, well, Seinfeld had no grand character based premise and right. never chase Seinfeld. People I know, right. just stop, just, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know. That's great advice. Never chase Seinfeld because I feel like people still are doing that. Plus, um, he's in a Porsche, so you can't catch him. He's <laughs> no, you'd never catch him or whatever car he's having coffee with. I, I, I by the way, I was so naive when Kevin... R so we're doing the show. Kevin Riley leaves Fox. Uh, mm. And Gary and Dana come in. And I was clueless that this was bad news for me. Yeah. <laughs> hello. Hello, new bosses. Yeah, I remember Kevin Riley, a wonderful, wonderful man and a brilliant guy. We're on the phone and he goes, I'm I'm really sorry. I just I uh I, I wanted this show to work. You know, I I you you've done something good and he was because he was he was out of Fox and I was on the phone with him like, well, you should be sorry. You you don't have the same job anymore, but like I'm fine. I <laughs> right. they'll they'll come to a tape night and fall in love with it, you know. <laughs> I'm sure they but have their own. Slate, but they'll see what <laughs> yeah, got find room for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> my my show United We Fall, this ABC thing. So I I fly United to up front. We fall. Ah, <laughs> yes, thank you. He does listen. Uh, it's like it's like slipping in the same patch of grease. Uh, <laughs> they they so they fly me out to upfronts, and it's like we're they don't they're not showing the sh like I I keep anticipating. Well, that now they'll show that trailer and they don't show it and then at one point uh eli manning comes on stage for a 15 minute live interview with scott van pelt oh, no. <laughs> like the most boring and i like scott van that's no criticism but what are you gonna say at upfronts like oh eli are you excited for the season and he's like yeah i think you know and, and i'm just going like what the and then <laughs> they don't show they don't show a trailer for the show and then i'm still kind of like yeah, but I mean, if we hit our numbers, you know. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> like, no, they're not doing the show. They didn't even, like, show it. Oh, that's brutal. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, John, we, we just have, like, one or two more questions here. So um, did we do – sorry to interrupt, but did yeah. we do, like – how many um, episodes of Dads was there? 20? 18? 20. 20. You got to 20? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, one or two didn't air. There was the Lost Dads that didn't. Yeah, air. there's there's the Lost Dads out there, uh, which yeah. I don't remember. Ooh. I remember there was a funeral in it, but I don't remember Fiends. anything more about it. How do you look back on Dads? Oh God, I, I it's almost like I, I I haven't totally sorted it out yet, but I do feel like we had so much fun in the making of it. But but like you, I was not. Uh, I just wasn't wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready to run a show. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know everything that went into it, and I didn't know that that would mean I would have to put extra into uh, the writing part of it, which I thought we were all just laughing in the room. Put that in with really little thought about how this is all going to hang together as a satisfying episode of television. It was I I kind of uh, tend to go for the joke 
at the expense of the story, you know, like I don't mind if a joke is funny and it, it does has no help to the story or even kind of hurts it. Like I'll, I'll just kind of put that in, but turns out when you make a show, that's a lot of that, nobody gives a shit about what the show is. Like you just right. don't give anyone the opportunity to care about right. the characters. So again, right. you can tell how I scattered I am. I felt that, and I, I said this at the time, but like it took place in San Francisco, but no one even knew that. Like that wasn't <laughs> <Right>. the, <laughs> that is like you, you could do funny San Francisco stuff and we could have. But like uh-huh. you had no idea that that was their environment. And they and they worked at a video game company. And literally the dialogue about that is like, is the game done? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, the game is going to take another week. <laughs> like, there was, you know, I felt like. At the time, as a writer, I remember, I remember trying to flag that maybe we could dig into some specifics yeah. of what we had set up and then kind of meeting with enough mockery and resistance that I just <laughs> it One thing I look back on and really kick myself, not that it would have made the difference, but like my character works for Martin Short, who's kind of like a, a Howie Mandel comedian who was doing a big network like super high octane game show called celebrity you guessed it and (laughs) uh and yet like because i as a comedian had written for different i'd I'd written for different comedians to do panel and stuff or when people were on a publicity tour i'd like write jokes for their late night spots and stuff um because i'd done that i thought well he should also do that for lou martin short's character so he would work with him in his apartment too so we had this massive penthouse set when really, like, I remember it was Dan Levy at the time was like, you should just work on a show like Deal or No Deal. Like, that's a, that has a set. It has a funny world to it. And we yeah. gradually got there. But the yeah. fact that I kept this apartment set, because I'm like, well, when you have these jobs, you know, you have to write for a lot of things. So you, we also should see them working in his personal space. <laughs> Such a waste of time. and money. Martin Short's a funny guy, though. The oh. funniest. I uh, yes. I mean that was cuz we're we're older than you are by about a decade and that was what locked me into SNL was that one outlier season with Martin Short, Billy Crystal, Christopher Guest, Harry Shearer. That was it's fucking fantastic. You can yeah. still see a lot of that on Peacock, which is very satisfying. Yeah, Jackie Rogers Jr. Oh. Uh, Jackpot Watt is so funny. So funny. Um, All right. Well, let's because we are ostensibly about writing here. So I just wanted to first of all, your special, as we talked about up top, Baby J is going to be, I believe, out tomorrow when if you're listening to this on uh, on a Monday. So April 25th, it's coming out on Netflix. Is um, was it a good experience putting this set together? Are you uh, like how did you feel about this one compared to some of your others? Oh, well, this one, um, so this special covers a a big recent period where um, I had a pretty severe drug problem, had a big intervention, right? went into treatment for a few months, uh, and that fills up a lot of this. I mean, there's a lot to it. I, I, I think people really enjoy it. I don't mean to give it sort of just that bullet point, but it's, uh, it felt different, but it didn't also. I, I felt like it was just, I, I was giving more detail to um, stuff I'd talked about already, but uh, I recognize that this is, um, in, in a way I'm really proud of, digs deeper into some uh, some things that were, you know, I'm not proud of and were really difficult. Yeah. Working on it was like, uh, working on it was fun. I mean, it was like, it was like a almost a two year tour. Uh, wow! So you know, I got to I got to really um, try everything I wanted to try and uh, narrowed it down. This is a little longer than my last specials, which I'm actually really happy about because I was cool. I thought this is the time to tell all of these stories um, and get them all down. And I really I I think um, I think people will really like it. I hope they do. Um, But I, yeah, it's like, it is quote unquote difficult. You know, you you could say, oh, it was difficult to talk about such things, but it it wasn't. It was was a lot of of fun. When you're you're in treatment, do you find that like you're performing and you're writing 
do you are you ever able to parse is it more a cause or solution to sort of your internal torment like when you get in there are you writing instantly because you're like as bad as this is for me personally this is funny and i should start or are you just kind of like i need to focus on me as a person and like forget about that crap oh no i did forget about that but um well, interestingly, I was I was in treatment twice. Uh, I was in for a little while, then I relapsed, and then had to go again. You know, the first time I was I was wanted to be the most interesting person in group, and was 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 <laughs> yeah, aware of, yep. and occasionally had some beats uh, <laughs> written out. I mean, I really, I really, <laughs> I. <laughs> you know there were the we would read goodbye letters when people checked out and like i oh. i didn't not work on mine um <laughs> <laughs> and uh and that was like uh and i thought i was i thought i was doing so well because uh you're so <laughs> because i'm getting big laughs yeah i was like i'm so good in group so yeah, I, right. i'm so good in group comedians uh, can con therapy to a disturbing degree by yeah. treating it like a talk show i've learned and and, and not just being funny like i knew what levels of candor are mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. uh seem vulnerable i mean it's it's a, it's a sick skill oh, God. <laughs> it's a sick skill and it's it's not great in those situations my one-on-one -on -one counselor at my first rehab said to me uh at the end he goes you present very well and that's what terrifies me Mm -hmm. And wow. I thought your mask is strong. Yeah. I thought, I thought, yeah, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm presenting well. That's yeah. You hear. I'm presenting well. You uh, noticed me? <laughs> uh, well, I, I can't wait to hear about all that stuff and I will be watching it tomorrow with, I'm sure most of our fans. So please go check out John Mulaney's baby J on Netflix and John, you've been so generous with your time today. Yes. And again, I guess we begrudgingly have to thank Dan Levy for all this. But you are he's so our, he's he's the millennial Lou Schneider. He's <laughs> <laughs> that's Shout right. Out to no, the, yeah, Dan will step up at our wedding and say these two. I knew it. Um, but you Did were Lou Schneider. Do that. No, 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 no. I'm just saying like, there, there's always the person who brings people together and then at oh, the wedding, they're like, this is my moment. <laughs> um, anyway, you've been very fun to talk to. We yes. really appreciate it. it. And so thank you so much for being here, John Mulaney. Thank you for having me. And next time I reach out, you know, just ask me a little faster, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Take a hit. We will. We will do that. Thanks for having me. Thank yeah. you.